Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our 12th in the series of system-wide COVID-19 town halls for Washington State University. My name is Phil Weiler. I'm Vice President for Marketing and Communications, and I'm gonna be the moderator for our session today. Today's town hall is gonna to cover a variety of different topics. I wanted to give you just a quick preview about what we'll be talking about. As most people know, we've made some changes to our spring semester academic calendar. So we'll walk through those and talk about what those mean and, and what the implications are for different members of the WSU community. But then I'd like to spend some time talking about some of the research that WSU faculty are doing in the area of COVID-19. As a land grant university, WSU is charged with doing research into the problems that are facing society today. And WSU is definitely living up to its land grant mission with regard to COVID-19, whether it's our WC Extension Service working on issues of food insecurity or pharmaceutical interventions that are being uh, developed to deal with COVID-19 related symptoms, WCU has a deep and broad portfolio of, of COVID related research, uh, much more than we can talk about in one hour. So in fact, our November and December uh, sessions will also touch on some of the research we're doing with regard to COVID-19 and how that, um, how that lives into our, our land grant mission. Um, but then we're gonna close with a little bit of information about the status of some of the COVID-19 illnesses that we've experienced here in the Pullman campus. So I'd encourage you to stick around for that as well. Let me introduce our panelists and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're joined today by Kirk Schultz, president of Washington State University, Elizabeth Chilton, our provost and senior vice president, Lisa Gloss, Dean of the WSU Graduate School. Dave Soleil, Vice President for Academic Outreach and Innovation and the Chancellor of the WSU Global Campus. Next, we have Celestina Barbosa-Liker. Um, she's joining us in her capacity as the Vice Chancellor for Research for the WSU Health Sciences Campus. Then we're gonna hear from Stephanie Seifert. She's an Assistant Professor at the Paul G. Allen School for Global Animal Health. And then also uh, Dr. Michael Letko, who's also an assistant professor at the Paul G. Allen School for Global Animal Health. And finally, we'll conclude with uh, some comments from Jason Sampson, who's the assistant director of environmental services, public health and sustainability for WSU. So let me turn it over to President Schultz. We can go ahead and get started and uh, looking forward to the next hours. So thanks for joining us. Well, <clears throat> hello, Cougs, and uh, welcome to a great Wednesday. It's always a great day to be a Coug, and today is no different than any other time. So I've got several things I just want to start off with today. First, let me acknowledge our families, our students, our faculty and staff, and this is still a very challenging time for so many uh, members of the Coug family. Uh, whether you're a student uh, dealing with uh, remote educational experiences and bandwidth and you know, kind of missing being around people, uh, whether you're uh, a family uh, that is trying to struggle with K through 12, uh, having some folks also in higher education and balancing uh, work related with that. Uh, we have uh, students, faculty and staff dealing with day daycare issues, elder care issues, all that while balancing that out, a pandemic, uncertainty around our financial future, uh, as well as trying to work full time. It's just a really challenging time. And I just wanna express my appreciation to all of our faculty and staff for the great work they continue to do to engage with our students, uh, to work on service, to help uh, the state of Washington as our economy improves. And we're gonna hear from some of our exceptional faculty doing research today uh, around COVID-19 related things. And I look forward to hearing what they're doing and hearing what some of their colleagues are doing in subsequent town halls. Um, I, a couple things I just want to remind everybody, we have no playbook uh, that we go to and read chapter three and know exactly what to do in something like this. And we continue to learn as we go along. And I think that's an important thing. As we start talking about spring semester, uh, one of the things is we've got to learn about what worked really well for us in the fall 
semester and some things that maybe didn't work as well. So that means we're going to have to be adaptable. We have to change and uh, not everybody's always happy about those things, but we're learning as we're going along. We're communicating with higher education folks around the country, around the state. And I think that's an important thing to remember. Um, I uh, worked with a lot of our PAC-12 presidents to put us in a position to safely be able to resume a lot of our intercollegiate athletics activities and sports. And I'm a football fan, a basketball fan. You know, I'm really cranked and excited by that. One of the things that we're going to be asking Cougs, though, is uh, I know we play University of Oregon in, in November uh, here in Pullman. We're asking you to please not come to Pullman. Uh, please do not come uh, and say, hey, I know I can't get in the stadium, but I just want to be there anyway. Uh, we're going to continue to communicate and ask people tailgate from your home uh, with a couple and only a couple of your closest friends and family members. But be careful about gathering. And uh, again, we want to emphasize, watch it on TV, cheer loudly, cheer for the Cougs, but do that from the safety of your own home and uh, don't come to Pullman uh, to say, hey, I'm going to participate anyway. Now, this is not one of those things where I'm saying, you know, uh, you all need to do that, but it's going to be different for me. Uh, president of the university and first lady will be watching our football games from our house, uh, watching them on TV, just like everybody else will be doing. So we really need your help in doing this and making sure that we continue to manage COVID-19 as effectively as possible uh, in the Pullman community and all of our other campus communities. And finally, um, you know, we made some announcements that we'll talk more about on the spring semester and uh, not everybody agrees with uh, the no tailgating thing or no spring break or starting things later. And we hear from you. Uh, please know that we're gonna continue to make the best decisions based on data and information that we have, even if those aren't popular or the type of thing that people think that we're clueless, we'll continue to communicate clearly uh, and we want to hear back from you when you don't uh, appreciate what we do. Uh, we also want to hear from you if you think, hey, that was a really good decision. But keep that information flow going. But please know we're going to continue to make the decisions that we think are the absolute best for the health and safety of our faculty, staff, and students and the communities where WSUS campuses. So uh, I look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Thank you all for joining us today. It's amazing to think that we've done 12 of these and that we're going to keep doing them as long as they're effective in providing information uh, for the Coug Nation. So thanks for being with us today. And as always, go Cougs. Thanks, President Schultz. Uh, I'm looking here on the uh, YouTube Live. We've got more than 900 people who are joining us already. So um, clearly, I think this is uh, addressing a need that people are seeing. They're willing to spend their time with us to, to hear what's happening with regard to COVID. Um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Provost Chilton, if I could. I, I know that we did make an announcement recently about a change in the academic calendar. Can you remind us what those changes entailed? And then also, what was the thinking behind making that change to the calendar? Yes, thank you for, for the question, Phil. Um, you know, as President Schultz just said, all of the decisions that we make are done collaboratively, uh, we talk among the president's cabinet and um, all of our decisions are guided by the principle of wanting to keep our students, faculty, staff and our communities um, healthy and safe. Um, and um, also, as Kirk said, we don't have a playbook. And so oftentimes we look to our peer institutions, things that worked this semester, things that didn't work so well this semester, either for us or from, from our peers. Um, and we also look at the science and the epidemiology and uh, the, some of the research that's coming out of scholars, including those who are going to be presenting today. So um, a number of institutions have made changes to their spring calendar, including elimination of spring break or late starts, et cetera to um, ensure that as we're uh, launching a new testing protocol, that uh, once we've got people safely either moved into where they're going to be, that we're not sending people away and bringing them back again and starting that whole process all over. So institutions like Carnegie Mellon, Ohio State, Wisconsin-Madison, Iowa State, uh, Purdue, Kentucky, I could go on, but a number of institutions were looking carefully at 
you know, what are, what are they doing? Not that we just follow what the PAC does, no, no pun intended, but that we, um, you know, are guided by um, the same kinds of guiding principles that many of our peers are. So we're going to start the semester um, eight days later than normal. We're gonna start on January 19th um, rather than the 11th. That'll give the winter time a little time to way out of flu or whatever is going on. Um, and also it will give us an extra, some extra time for potentially a staggered move in in concert with our arrival testing for on-campus housing in on the Pullman campus. The other campuses came along with us and, and we did this as a system because we share a lot of curriculum among the, among the, uh, the, the physical campuses in the WSU system. Um, and so we'll start a week later. Uh, we will eliminate the spring break, but instead implement academic breaks. Um, these are all on our website, but Thursday, February 25th, Wednesday, March 17th, Tuesday, April 13th, um, and also President's Day on Monday, February 15th. And we'll start regular time. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll end the semester at a regular time. Overall, this actually means there's about a week less, a week fewer of classes total for the spring. And this still meets our accreditation criteria, but we'll just give everyone a little bit less of an intense uh, spring semester, we hope. And we understand that one solid week of break would be preferable for many. Um, but if, in concert with our testing protocol, it just wouldn't allow us to safely move people out and move people back in and, and maintain our, our standards for that. So Phil, I, I also did want to just mention in case people are curious, um, some of our colleges, uh, uh, for example, um, pharmacy, nursing, veterinary medicine, and a couple of our MBA programs, um, they have partnerships with other institutions and could not adjust their calendar. So if you're curious to know, you can go to registrar.wsu.edu slash academic calendar and one of our content experts can put that link up in the chat there. Um, and you can search any campus and any term and see the academic calendar that pertains to that degree program. Terrific, thank you. You answered actually all the questions I had. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, Lisa, if I could turn it to you, I do know that there was some concern among graduate students, questions that we had received. I'm wondering how this might impact um, graduate students who are, who are teaching in the classrooms or how this might impact research that they might be doing um, on the various campuses. Could you talk about how this delayed start might impact graduate students and again, are there going to be any consequences for those students who either uh, work in labs or might work in one of our extension research centers? Good morning, Phil. Um, good morning to everyone. And thank you for those questions. I appreciate the opportunity to address graduate education. So I'm going to take this in a different number of topics. So for students taking graduate students taking classes, they'll have the same impact as on undergraduate education of a condensed semester. Um, with breaks, one day breaks instead of a whole week of break uh, and the consequences that brings that Provost Chilton already addressed. Um, assistantships, that's probably one of the biggest issues for graduate students. Assistantships will still start on January 1, as they have for years, and go through May 15th. So there will be no change in the support of graduate students. They will still receive the same number of assistantships. For students and research assistantships doing research, that doesn't really have much effect. I mean, they've been doing their research all along. For students on teaching assistantships, it may seem a little odd because they'll be on an assistantship for a week when they're not actually teaching, but they will still be expected to do assistantship duties. And in fact, that week when we normally would have class in a regular year, but are not having that, that gives the, those students an extra week to prepare to get ahead for when we start the more condensed semester where we don't have spring break uh, as a whole week set aside to catch up. So as far as assistantship and student support, tuition waivers, et cetera, there should be no effect on graduate students. Um, research. So to the extent that we're able to continue a safe environment and continue the ramp up to research that we've been ongoing since 
uh, June, as long as that stays on board, there should be no effect on most research and scholarly activity functions of graduate school students, many who, particularly in the STEM areas, are still on the WSU campuses, Pullman, Spokane, uh, Vancouver, Tri-Cities. Uh, for the r &E centers, again, the same thing. To the extent which ramp up in the research, we can still do research in a protected manner with social distancing, wearing masks, et cetera. The change in the schedule should not affect research. Where there might be some concern, and I don't have a really good answer to this, but I think being aware of it and planning ahead will help, is that many students have taken the um, option of um, using spring break to do field research, to leave the campus, well, there's not going to be that break. For students who are not taking didactic coursework, that really won't be much of an effect. For those that students that are trying to balance both their research schedule and their and taking courses, there's gonna to need to be some flexibility and some understanding of that. And that'll be up to individual students and faculty advisors to work with that sort of thing. But again, communication is gonna be one of the keys of getting through this communication and collaboration and compromise to make sure that everybody can continue their research and be successful in their coursework and in their teaching assistantship duties. Um, I think that answered all the questions you asked. Is there anything you'd like me to expand upon? No, I think that covered it. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. As I said, uh, we had heard from graduate students who wanted to make sure they really understood what the implications were for them. So thanks for doing that. Um, Dave, if I could turn to you now, I know um, when we made the decision to move to virtual learning for the fall semester, some faculty members um, have elected to use a service called Proctor U to help supervise testing. Um, there's been some questions from students about what is Proctor U, how does it work? And uh, my understanding is that it is a service that Global Campus uses. So I wonder, can you just fill us in on what is Proctor U and, and, and how does it actually work for students who are taking advantage of that service? Certainly, yeah. Um... So assessment has been a focus of our faculty uh, ever since the pivot to, to remote learning in the spring. And faculty have been extremely creative in how they have employed assessment strategies in their courses. Uh, some of our faculty have chosen uh, to use an online proctoring service called, called ProctorU. Uh, it, it allows students to take uh, assessments in their home, uh, on their computer, and a, and a proctor uh, monitors a student to ensure academic integrity. Um, I think I think we're right now about four percent of WSU courses are using uh, Proctor U, uh, and um, those those courses oftentimes uh, don't allow for alternative types of assessment, um, really that can that aren't replaced uh, um, by using a using a proctor. Um, you know, Global's been using uh, a proctoring service for for years um, because Global is a virtual environment. Uh, we allow students, again, to take assessments from their home. Uh, we used to use physical proctoring where students would uh, find a proctor in their local community uh, and they would travel to that site and take the assessment there. This really, uh, the, the tools like Proctor, you really have provided that flexibility for our students to not have to leave their home. They can manage it on their own time. Uh, they don't have to coordinate with, uh, with a physical proctor. That said, if, if students are currently uncomfortable uh, using Proctor U, we still have that physical Proctor uh, structure in place. And so if a student would rather use a physical Proctor going to a physical location and being Proctored, uh, they have the option of working with their faculty uh, to, to set that up. So that is an option for students who uh, may be uncomfortable using an online Proctoring service. Furthermore, um, as we move through uh, this semester, we've also worked with Proctor U to set up uh, a couple of thousand practice, practice exams, which allows students to log into the system prior to taking their, their actual exam to identify any um, technical uh, or operational glitches uh, that they might encounter. And, and the one thing I would offer uh, as, as students move uh, to uh, online proctoring or an online assessment, um, really follow the instructions. What, what, we, what we found are oftentimes the, the challenges that are coming with connecting with ProctorU 
uh, are because the, the instructions aren't, aren't being followed. And so one of the things we're also doing is creating a WSU video on exactly how to set up that proctoring session for our students. And that should be available sh uh, shortly. So I think that answers the questions you asked, Phil. Is there anything else? No, I think that covers it. Thank you. So it sounds like um, there'll be resources available for students who want to make sure they're using ProctorU correctly. Um, if students want to have another alternative to ProctorU, that's an option. They can work with their faculty members to, uh, uh, to, to explore those different options. So thanks for sharing that. And again, I guess the other piece that's worth noting is, as you mentioned, about only about 4% of classes are using uh, ProctorU. So it's a, it's a relatively small number. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like now to spend some time talking about some of the research that uh, WSU faculty members are doing around COVID-19. And uh, what I'd like to do is to start with Celestina Barbosa Liker. Um, she is the, the uh, person who's in charge of research for the Health Sciences Campus. And obviously those, we all know the Health Sciences Campus includes colleges of pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences, nursing and medicine. Um, clearly COVID-19 is, is um, you know, very much in the, in the concerns of, of those three colleges. We don't have the time to really cover absolutely everything that's happening on the Spokane campus, but Celestina, if you could just give us um, a, a flavor of the kinds of work that's being done by faculty and researchers there, um, it would be something we'll be hopefully be able to pursue in greater detail in some future uh, COVID-19 town halls. So let me turn it over to you, Celestina, if I could. Great, thank you so much, Phil. Um, I'm honored to share some of the COVID-19 research coming out of the College of Nursing, the College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, and the Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine. But first I wanna recognize that almost none of our research is done in isolation on the Health Sciences Spokane campus. We work in collaboration across campuses, colleges, extension sites, and many, many clinical partners across the state of Washington and beyond. So the research that I'm gonna share is not just from the WCU Health Sciences Spokane campus, but research where at least one primary investigator resides in one of our three colleges, recognizing the extensive network of researchers across the WCU system that's contributed to this work. So let me first start with some examples of published work or work that's been highlighted in the press recently. So coming out of the College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, pharmaceutical scientist, Dr. Sentil Nateson is part of a research team working to unravel the molecular mechanisms that drive COVID-19's potentially fatal exaggerated lung inflammation response. He's also working in collaboration with the College of Veterinary Medicine on the Pullman campus to help with identifying a peptide that could potentially be used to inhibit the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Another pharmacy faculty member, Dr. Josh Newmiller, was appointed to the American Diabetes Association's COVID-19 Expert Advisor Panel, which studies the impact of the virus has on people living with diabetes. In the College of Nursing, two faculty members, Drs. Marion Wilson and Dr. Shelley Fritz from the Vancouver campus, tested a fabric mask with a filter that's available at big box stores as a last resort option when N95 masks are unavailable. They tested two models on hospital staff members and their work will be published next month. Researchers in the College of Nursing and in the College of Medicine, so Dr. Smith, Berdouli, Graves, Cardi, Hebert, Ms. Brooks and myself, and so many students in the Colleges of Nursing and Medicine have established a WSU COVID Infant Maternal and Family Health Collaborative. So this is a multi-college, multi-campus collaborative. Um, so it includes Drs. Gartstein, Crespi, Waters, Meehan across the Pullman and Vancouver campuses, again, across many colleges. And we aim to address different aspects of the infant and maternal health um, issues as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic. This includes three ongoing studies. So the first one is to look at the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on pregnant and parenting women who need access to substance use treatment. Another one identifies areas of stress, coping, and resources needed for pregnant and parenting women during the pandemic. And then finally, one that's looking at the COVID-19 related stress on pregnant women as it relates to mental health and substance use due to feelings of isolation during the stay at home order. I also wanna give a shout out to Dr. Courtney Meehan and the Pullman Campus in the Arts and Sciences on our COVID-19 infant feeding study. 
And this is where we're recruiting COVID-19 positive mothers from Spokane and around the country to study infection risk and immunity in infants. In the Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine, researchers in the Department of Nutrition and Exercise Physiology have surveyed more than 900 pairs of twins to study the impact of Washington State, State's COVID-19 stay-at-home order on physical activity, alcohol use, and mental health. And this work is led by Dr. Glenn Duncan and Ms. Ellie Avery. In one study, they found that people who reported increasing their physical activity levels after the start of COVID-19 stay-at-home order reported higher levels of stress and anxiety than those whose activity levels stayed the same. In another study, they reported that alcohol use changed almost immediately after the stay-at-home order was issued, and they looked at this relationship with stress and anxiety. Researchers in the College of Medicine have also been doing modeling and geographic information systems mapping to support hospitals, health authorities, and policymakers in their decision making related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So one example is led by Dr. Ofer, Ofer Amram, and this includes the COVID-19 uh, Urban Rural Explorer or CURE. And this is a tracking tool that provides a daily snapshot into COVID-19 cases in rural communities across the country. So this tool enables users to identify rural counties with both limited hospital capacity and rapidly growing COVID-19 case numbers. Dr. Amram also developed a capacity modeling tool in partnership with the Spokane Regional Health District and MultiCare. And this tool allows administrators to plug in COVID-19 data and predict the future need for resources such as personal protective equipment and ventilators. College of Medicine research, researchers led by Pablo Montsevayas is also has also developed a COVID-19 vulnerability risk index for Washington State. This tool is an interactive map that combines key risk factors and population density to better understand how communities differ in their vulnerability to COVID-19. Dr. Monsivayas and his research team also teamed up with the city of Spokane to test wastewater for the novel coronavirus. And this, um, they've sampled wastewater from city pipes in three separate Spokane neighborhoods and analyzed it for the virus. And finally, in uh, the College of Medicine, researcher Dr. Jay Kennedy is leading an effort to evaluate the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on people with disabilities in the United States. His team has surveyed centers for independent living and their staff and consumers to determine COVID-19 related needs. So that's just some of our recent research going on across our three colleges, but we've also been awarded some grant funding to begin COVID-19 research. And this includes a $4.4 million NIH grant awarded to Dr. Deidre Buchwald in the Institute for Research and Education to Advance Community Health, or IREACH. And this project, which is called COVID-19 Epidemiology Research, Testing and Services, or CONCERTS, involves researchers from WSU, the University of Colorado, and the University of Minnesota. They're going to partner with urban Indian health programs in six major cities to understand who's been tested for COVID-19 already and what challenges exist for getting people tested and ultimately vaccinated. This grant also provides funds for overseeing resources to promote testing at each site. And the cities involved in this grant are Albuquerque, Anchorage, Denver, Minneapolis, Wichita, and Seattle. There's also funding from the Andy Hill Care Fund for two projects related to COVID-19 and cancer. So one study on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the health and well-being of cancer patients living in rural and tribal communities in our state is led by Dr. Patrick Johansson from iReach. And then there's a study that will evaluate the impact of missed or deferred cancer preventative care during the COVID-19 stay-at-home order in Washington State, and this is led by Dr. Ofer Amram. And this will look at administrative data from multi-care clinics um, related to canceled screenings and visits, care delays, and the number of positive cervical, breast, and colon cancer cases. This is just a snapshot of some of the research that we're working on as it relates to COVID-19. And this is above and beyond our areas of research and excellence in understanding autism, cancer, chronic illness and disability, 
drug delivery and safety, neurological diseases in the brain, and the research that we do to promote health and improving the quality of life research in addiction and chronic pain, community health, health in the built environment, and sleep productivity and health functioning. So lastly, I wanna send a huge thank you to all of our grants and contracts managers and coordinators and all of the research administrative staff that's been working tirelessly to make sure that our grants get out the door. <laughs> we cannot be doing this work without all of the research staff that support the entire research enterprise at WSU. So thank you for letting me share some of our COVID-19 research with all of you as we all work to improve the health and well-being of all of the residents of the state of Washington and beyond. Thank you. Thanks, Celestina. I'm I'm smiling because as you were as you were talking, I was thinking, wow, that is just a tremendous amount of work to manage all of those grants. And so nice of you to, to uh, call out those uh, support staff who are helping researchers secure the grants and then make sure that uh, the research is being done. So a huge amount of information to share with us. Thank you so much. What I'd like to do now is really dive a little bit deeper into uh, the work of two researchers. Um, again, I mentioned it was uh, Drs. Stephanie Seifert and Drs. Michael, Dr. Michael Letko from the, um, the Paul G. Allen School of Global Animal Health. They are doing some really interesting work, at least from my perspective, um, not only looking at COVID, but also looking at the possibility of future pandemics. And, and Stephanie, can you spend a little bit of time talking about the work you're doing about exploring bat biology and looking at how viruses may jump from the animal host to humans? Yeah, I can. Thank you uh, for having me here to, to talk to you all this morning about some of the work uh, that we're doing at the Paul Allen School and that... Um, I've been doing with uh, NIH, where I just moved from NIH to start a, a faculty position here. I'm gonna try to share my screen. So uh, early on in the pandemic, I was uh, still at the National Institutes of Health where I was um, part of the pandemic response and just trying to understand the basic biology of this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus that is the agent of uh, COVID-19, um, including some uh, efforts to, to figure out how to best decontaminate uh, PPE like N95s for reuse during the, uh, you know, the shortage of, of available PPE to deal with this pandemic. Um, and now that we're moving on into the phase of learning better treatments on the medical side and, and the transmission of this virus is really dominated at this point by human to human transmission. Uh, we're starting to dive back into the ecology to prevent the next pandemic. So SARS-CoV-2 is uh, not the first coronavirus to spill into the human population. Coronaviruses are also responsible for a lot of uh, livestock disease, livestock illness and pathology in dogs and cats as well. There are a lot of different coronaviruses that are either zoonotic, meaning they transmit from animals to humans, or that uh, get into animal populations uh, that affect uh, our economy or you know, the welfare of our companion animals. So the way that I think about uh, zoonotic pathogens and zoonotic spillover from animals into humans is that there's this cumulative risk of many different components. So a lot of different things have to align in order for a pathogen to spill into the human population. Um, and for some viruses, this, this transmission chain is very well characterized, including rabies virus. And when we have a very good characterization of how transmission occurs or how the, the pathogen is maintained in wildlife or domestic animal populations, we're able to design um, intervention strategies around this transmission chain because we can identify vulnerable points. So for rabies virus, um, most rabies virus cases around the world in humans are, uh, are linked to dog bites. Oops. And um, with, with dog bites, we understand that rabies virus is maintained uh, in this reservoir that has a very close interface with humans. And that allows us to develop strategies, for instance, with the Rabies Free Africa program that happens, it's a longstanding um, collaboration with our East Africa campus and, and faculty members um, were able to 
do these large vaccination campaigns as part of the WHO initiative, which is zero by 30. So this is a very terrible disease with a very high case fatality rate. And because we understand the transmission chain, we're able to um, really successfully mitigate that transmission to humans and control the virus population in domestic animals that are the most likely to actually lead to transmission to humans. So for viruses like Ebola virus, which is uh, my background before the SARS-CoV-2 um, COVID pandemic, I was studying Ebola viruses in bats in Africa. We don't have a reservoir identified and we really don't understand right now how these viruses are getting into the human population. So we can't really develop effective mitigation strategies, which is obviously uh, important if we wanna start uh, preventing the next pandemic. Um, so a big part of my research is in identifying reservoirs for some of these viruses, but then also determining the diversity of coronaviruses that exist in bat populations around the world. Um, and so this is kind of the direction that we're going now uh, in our research is to kind of take what we've done for the Ebola viruses. So um, in a previous study, I've been uh, the lead on a longitudinal sampling campaign for African bats to sample for Ebola viruses that cause hemorrhagic uh, fever in humans. And so I've been sampling for many years from this hammer-headed fruit bat that you can see um, right in an endemic zone for Ebola virus. And what we found with this longitudinal study is that you have a peak of juvenile bats. So the bat reproduction is timed around the rainy season when you have an abundance of fruits available uh, so that when the juvenile bats are leaving their mothers, um, that's when we think they're actually exposed for the first time to these Ebola viruses, which tells us that there is likely a seasonality to risk for Ebola virus spillover. Um, and so this is the kind of uh, work that we are hoping to do with coronaviruses, uh, both in the US and, and in Africa, is to start identifying other coronaviruses that are circulating in these bat populations, um, coronaviruses that are closely related to SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2, um, and MERS coronavirus. And then we can start to identify the viruses that are um, at the greatest risk of being transmitted into humans and then also understanding how these viruses circulate in these bat populations. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and pass you on to Michael. Yep, all right, um, thanks. For, uh, for that wonderful introduction actually to what I'm about to show here. So I'm gonna quickly talk about some of the work um, uh, that I'm doing to basically uh, build a coronavirus database um, to help us better understand how these viruses are actually transmitting between species and then more importantly, um, learn something about them so that we can try to prevent this from happening in the future. So, um, as Steph uh, kind of alluded to, there are a lot of new viruses being discovered uh, in wildlife all the time. Um, but unfortunately, most of these viruses are actually never really isolated. So that leaves a big question open. Uh, really, are these viruses a risk to humans? When we find a new sequence, we don't have a, a really easy way of addressing this question yet. And so that's what uh, my work is really aiming to, um, to try to build on is coming up with a series of new tools that we can use to better understand uh, the risk uh, that these viruses pose to uh, global health. And this is kind of a multi-pronged uh, effort. The first step really involves um, making new laboratory tools to study all of these new viruses. And this is a combination of protein engineering and synthetic biology. Had success, uh, some success already with this, um, looking at the Sarbico family of viruses, which includes uh, SARS coronavirus 2, which we're now all familiar with. Um, so once we have these tools in the lab, we need to then test them as they're discovered. And this is uh, really, we kind of exemplified this um, back in January, just 12 days after the genome, we were able to use the tools that we had developed to rapidly uh, characterize and identify the receptor for SARS-2. And then to extend this, we're now using these for active surveillance. So we have collaborators um, with Columbia, we found uh, collaborators with Columbia University, EcoHealth Alliance and PREDICT. And um, 
And uh, what we basically did was tested several viruses um, that they were uh, discovering and um, we put it on our platform. We've now uh, applied this um, or, or turned in applications uh, to kind of expand this work into other countries, into Tanzania and Kenya here at, at WSU. And then um, finally, once we have all of this data, really what do we do with it? And this is where the database building kind of comes into play. So, um, so in collaboration with folks in the bioinformatics and computational biology department here at WSU, uh, really planning out how we can take this data and use it more for predictive capabilities and for preventative capabilities. So uh, what we'll do is um, our, our database will be able to take in any novel viral genome sequence. We can then compare it to, um, to known uh, viral sequences that we've tested then in our laboratory and then identify similar sequences and then um, have this all uh, integrate into an overall uh, kind of score value for this novel uh, viral genome to understand or to kind of predict its ability to transmit or infect humans. Um, so why do we care about that? What's the whole reason uh, behind studying zoonotic risk? What do we do with this information? I think really one of the initial efforts uh, would be to improve the preventative medicine that we have. So this in, uh, includes uh, um, including our findings into new diagnostic assays. So as we find viruses that present more risk to, um, to, uh, to transmission, we can then include these viruses in our diagnostics so that we can uh, detect them earlier. We can build up broader acting universal vaccines that can target whole groups of viruses, broader antiviral drugs that work against a number of viruses. But this is only um, these are only problems that we can really study once we know the viruses that pose the, big the biggest risk. And then a second effort would be to do contact mitigation uh, with these higher risk species that are carrying these viruses. So reducing contact, uh, not only between humans, but also domestic animals uh, and these other um, kind of at risk species. Uh, and with that, I'll thank you for your attention and just plug that uh, my lab is now hiring grad students and a technician. I love the shameless plug. Good for you. <laughs> we need to do that more often, and particularly if there are uh, research opportunities or job open opportunities open for students. So thank you to the both of you. Really interesting information. Um, I, I, as both of you were speaking, I was thinking about the fact that I'm glad there are people out there who are looking over the horizon and trying to identify uh, where the next um, illnesses may come from and, and what we can do to ameliorate them and, and prevent them from making that that jump from animals to humans. So thank you for that, for that information. Um, what I'd like to do now, if I could, is I'd like to turn to Jason Sampson. Um, as many uh, people know, we did experience an outbreak among college-aged students, well, college-aged people in the Pullman community, particularly at the beginning of the academic year in that, that August and early September timeframe. And Jason and his team have been monitoring uh, those illnesses. They have been doing contact tracing for uh, students, faculty, and staff members who tested positive. And so um, we haven't really had an opportunity to talk about this yet at a town hall. And I'd love, Jason, can you give us a sense of um, how many tests have we performed to date? And maybe talk a little bit about the One Health Diagnostic Lab that I think we have mentioned in previous sessions. Thank you, Phil. Um, I'd gladly talk about that. As you know, we don't live on an island as a WSU. Um, we do have some impacts from Lake Talk County and Whitman County, but I'm really gonna try to focus on just what WSU has done. Um, obviously there was some disappointment early on that we didn't get testing up and running, but I'm really proud to say that with Cougar Health Services and the Air National Guard, over the last uh, several weeks, we've managed to do about 5,100 tests with uh, students and employees here on campus. And the great thing about those tests, we've actually been able to use, uh, kind of run the results in our own lab. Phil had mentioned the One Health lab. They've been worked with Insight early on to get an established lab here on campus. Um, that is Waddle. The, the diagnostic side for COVID-19 is One Health. And they don't just do WSU's testing there. Um, they run our tests. But they have also taken regional tests at 
uh, from the hospital, from Palouse Medical, from Whitman Hospital in Kofax, and other universities up in Spokane. And as of this week, the numbers I've seen, they've done about 2,600 to 27,000, uh, excuse me, thousand tests. That's about seven or 900 tests a day at that time. And there still is room for them to actually even run more. So they have not reached capacity. And that is a really good sign as we move forward to spring and we try to figure out what that testing plan for WSU will be. Um, as you know, we did have that spike in August and with that comes the need to contact trace because as we know, contact trace, as soon as we can get those people isolated and quarantined, we slow down that transmission. Um, we didn't expect to see a spike that large at the beginning, unfortunately, so we did some catching up, but we were able to train about 25 contact tracers on the WSU Pullman campus. Um, those contact tracers work directly with Whitman County, but we also been able to use those contact tracers to assist at our other um, campuses across the state, some of our research um, extension centers. And so we have them up and running and they'll continue to be ready to go moving into the spring and through the Christmas holidays and Thanksgiving break. Um, another thing that I like to look at is we did have this big spike, but what is actually happening now here on the campus? I think people look at that big number of positive tests and currently we've had about 1300 to 1400 positive tests associated with WSU students and employees. But we should know that we only have about 50 active cases. And what that means is we only have about 3% of those positives that are actually active or in isolation. And so it's much smaller than when you look at that big number of 1400 about. And um, we're hoping to keep it down at that because when you have a lower number, obviously there's a lower risk of transmitting it to other people. Um, some other stats that you actually looked at nationally and I think we got a lot of negative attention early on was the percent positivity. Um, we try to track that and when we look at percent positivity, we actually do look at the entire county versus WSU. So what we do is we take all the tests run from Loose Medical, Whitman Hospital, Cougar Health Services and the Air National Guard. And then we take a look at the positive cases associated with those tests. And for the week, um, last week, um, we actually had about 10% positivity. That may seem like a lot, but you gotta look at where we started. We actually started in the high 20%. So we've actually brought that down a lot. Um, and it, when you look at testing, um, early on when you target testing, that means when you're doing diagnostic testing, you're naturally gonna have a higher percentage of positivity. And as you start looking at the general population, your positivity drops, right? But we wanna make sure we're reaching out to everybody and we're continually seeing that number gradually drop. Um, as we move forward, we're hoping to get that down below 5%. That's always been the goal. That actually really shows you're actually um, reducing that transmission across uh, your community. Um, and the other one that we always look at, and this is from a county and the Department of Health likes to look at, look at it, is a two week running average. And that means every day you look at the last two weeks and how many cases you have. Um, we have had peaked at about 290 cases over a two week span. And that was actually right at the beginning of the, the semester, right in that first last week of August. Um, we're actually down, um, WSU is down to 57 to about 50 cases last week. And I guess that's why we're actually down also to the number of active cases, right? As we reduce that two week average, we're naturally gonna reduce the active cases. And we wanna, we've actually been really steady over the last three or four weeks on that. And so that is a really good sign that the students, employees that were really following those um, guidance, that's the mask wearing and things like that to show that it actually is working. And um, we're really seeing all this interaction um, from the transmission really occurring in the social setting versus um, settings in classrooms and research. And that's really important to know that when we actually follow those distancing plans, those disinfection plans, that we really have that potential to reduce that transmission. So Jason, you, you told us that the numbers are going in the right direction, which I think is great, but um, I appreciate the last thing you said, which is now is not the time for us to ease up on social distancing, on wearing masks, on avoiding large gatherings. Certainly we've he heard from um, healthcare professionals across the country that as we enter this, this fall and winter timeframe, the expectation is we're gonna see significant spikes across the country um, in, in cases. And so now is the time for us really to double down on uh, making sure we follow those. I mean, their basic, their basic guidelines are not difficult things for us to do, but we all need to make sure that we are 
wearing the masks, being physically distant, not getting together in groups. And that particularly I think as holidays approach, whether it's uh, winter holidays or, or Thanksgiving holidays, there's a, there's a desire to get together with larger groups and, and family members. And so we all need to be really careful that we don't use those uh, or don't have those events turn into um, spreader events. Uh, Jason, one thing I'd like to have you talk a little bit about is about the testing itself. I, I'm looking at the live chat here on YouTube and there was a person who had asked about what is the experience like? Um, what, is it, what does it feel like to be tested? And um, can you talk a little bit about what is, that, um, you know, what, is, what is that experience like? Is this one of the long swabs that tickle your brain as some people have said, or is it something different? Sure, I can uh, touch on that. Um, obviously, there was a, the original test that came out really scared people after they heard the first people got on there was a pharyngeal and it went significantly up your um, nasal passage. And a lot of people had this discomfort. And in fact, when they shared that with family and friends, people were actually scared to actually go get a test. Um, I can gladly say that the, um, the testing that One Health has set up for everybody is a self-administered nasal swab. Um, obviously you're doing this to yourself. So, um, I guess if you push it up yourself far enough to have pain, that I guess was up to you, but it actually has taken that away greatly. Um, you're still able to get a very effective result, but, um, it's a more, uh, very simple process. People walk you through it. And I know multiple people that have gone in, um, to, um, repeatedly to get tests as, uh, as, um, referred by their doctor, obviously every two weeks or when they become close contacts, but, um, their willingness to go back and do it again really speaks to the, 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 that we don't have that pain that was associated with those original tests. And it's probably worth uh, repeating to everybody that uh, testing is available at no cost to students on the Pullman campus, uh, as well as employees on the Pullman campus. We encourage everybody in Whitman County to, uh, regardless of what location they're working at in the county, to to take advantage of this testing. The university is covering the cost of these tests. They cost between 100 and about $125 a piece. We've spent well over $600,000 to date um, covering the cost of those tests so that we can make, make sure that cost is not a barrier. Um, as Jason mentioned, there is testing available uh, for students at Cougar Health Services on the Pullman campus. In addition, we're working with the National Guard they are moving their locations all around the city of Pullman, again, to reduce those barriers, to have them go to the, where the people are to make that testing as convenient as possible. You can find the location of the National Guard test uh, sites online if you go to wsu.edu and, um, and just Google COVID testing, you'll be able to find that information. So please definitely take advantage of that. The other thing I'll mention, this is something we've talked about previously as well, is we are entering flu season. Um, there are flu shot clinics available on all of our campuses or through all of our campuses across the system. Please take advantage of uh, your flu shot. Get it as early as you can. We don't want to have people who are getting sick from the flu and then having to compete with people who might be ill from COVID-19. So definitely take advantage of your flu opportunities. Jason, I just want to ask you one last question. I know the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta recently talked about the fact that if you had uh, contracted COVID-19 and recovered, that after approximately 90 days, it's a potential for you to be reinfected. We are getting close to that 90-day figure for some of our um, WSU Pullman students and faculty and staff who might have been infected early on. So can you talk a little bit about what that means and what uh, those individuals should be doing? Sure, um, obviously with uh, how new COVID-19 is, we continue to do research and WSU is helping kind of work uh, the numbers through to find out what the true, how long those antibodies last in your body. Right now, the CDC and State Department of Health know that the antibodies are good for 90 days. That means for those 90 days, Technically, right now, they do not believe you can be reinfected with COVID-19. This is really important when you talk about contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine. Um, after 90 days, from the Department of Health standpoint, when we talk to people, after they can potentially be um, infected again with COVID-19, 
So we're going to again ask people to quarantine and isolate if they test positive or if they're considered a close contact. And so a lot of people, when they got that original test positive, some people think that that's a free pass and that they're good for a long time. It's really important, important to note that, that that is actually not the case right now. Um, we're hoping that it actually is longer. I think a lot of people are crossing their fingers and hoping that they can't be reinfected. But for now, we do not know that. So we, those precautions that we took prior to that infection, um, we still need to actually take moving forward. And it's also good to just stay in that habit right now. We don't need people walking around because they had a positive test. And just because they can't get reinfected, it's a kind of a bad optic. And so please, if you've been uh, tested, please follow the same procedures that everybody else has to do. Um, it's just a really good practice. Great, thank you, Jason. Good advice. Um, as I said, now is not the time to for us to uh, uh, to let our guard down. We need to make sure we're following all those guidelines. We're getting close to the end, and I did see in the live chat here on YouTube there was some question about um, whether faculty were made aware of the decisions around changing the spring semester schedule and questions about whether students and student government were aware. My understanding is that both the faculty senate and student leadership had an opportunity to weigh in before the decision was made. But I guess, President Schultz, can you, can you share, is that information correct? Uh, Phil, thank you. And uh, Provost Chilton can talk specifically about our faculty engagement in this. But uh, I know uh, our students and many of our students expressed uh, a lot of dismay and felt that they had been left out of the decision-making process uh, surrounding cancellation of spring break and the change in the spring term. Um, what occurred was the faculty senate's purview is the academic calendar and Provost Chilton appropriately engaged with our faculty senate. Uh, they had several weeks into which to look at things and they actually held a, an advisory vote uh, which uh, was supportive of cancellation of spring break, spreading out three days through this semester and starting a week later. Uh, during that time, uh, what occurred was we did not engage our, our student government in the way that we normally would. That's a mistake on our part. Uh, however, we made sure that there was some time for them to provide some feedback uh, prior to the final decision being made. Um, this is one of those decisions that no matter what you decide, there's gonna be a significant percentage of the WSU community that just simply disagrees with it. And I think this is a case where we had very strong faculty support for the change in calendar uh, from the faculty senate. And, and we had pretty universal uh, disagreement with our student leadership. So the voice was heard. It's just we felt based on data uh, from other schools, what we saw in the spring semester of 2020, we really felt given where we expect to be with COVID-19, that this really is the best decision to make. Uh, I say that knowing that there's gonna be disagreement and people will feel it's the wrong decision or the wrong decision for things like mental health. But when we really consulted with folks, when we looked at what other universities have done, we really felt this was the right decision to make for WSU. So uh, lots of engagement. Uh, there was certainly lots of feedback prior to that decision being made, but this is a case where there's just going to be some disagreement and we still made the best decision we felt possible for WSU. Great, thank you. Provost Chilton, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add. I think it, I think we covered that, but I want to give you a chance to. Yeah, um, just briefly, um, as President Schultz said, um, we, we first floated the idea with the Faculty Senate and I, and I use that word very purposefully because we were, aware from the start that eliminating spring break that you know our faculty want that break our students want that break or um, our advisors you know in terms of zoom meetings it's not time off and vacation they're still reporting and they're still doing things but just to take a break from zoom um, so we floated it with the faculty senate and we had a week of about uh, of a number of um, pieces of feedback and sort of friendly amendments and a back and forth about which days and how long and when we'd start. Once the faculty senate, it really was not looking at first like the faculty senate were going to support it because of the desire for mental health break. Once the faculty senate did support it in an advisory council, the next day we reached out and shared the proposal with 
the Student Government Council, which represents all of the ASWSUs across the system. We met with them on that following Monday before making a final decision. Um, from now on, when we send things to the Faculty Senate, we're, we're copying SGC. Um, you know, in this case, we had to make a decision pretty quickly. And as President, President Schultz said, um, you know, there were lots of things to consider. And uh, we tried to be as transparent as we could as this uh, proposal was evolving. Thank you, Elizabeth, I appreciate that. Um, we are at the top of the hour. President Schultz, do you have any parting words before we are, are finished for the day? Well, once again, I uh, want to express my appreciation for everybody who's joined us, whether you're watching it live or watching it later on YouTube. Uh, I want to express my appreciation to our faculty colleagues who are doing some exceptional research and scholarship around COVID-19 related things and look forward and uh, other of these town halls to also hearing what our colleagues are doing uh, during this particular time. So uh, I just want to express my appreciation again to our faculty and staff and our students for their flexibility uh, in these times. And please know, regardless of whether everybody agrees with their decisions or not, we want to make sure that we're communicating uh, what we're doing, we're communicating why we're doing it, and we're just going to continue to use that and be as open and transparent as possible, acknowledging that there will be disagreement, but at the same time, making sure that we're always out there letting you know why we're choosing to do what we're doing. So as always, thank you and go Cougs. Thank you, President Schultz. I just have three quick items before we close off. I wanna remind people that Washington State University is in the midst of its week long virtual safety, health and security fair. Um, we have a series of flash talks each day. Today's flash talks are going to focus on wellness. Today's Wellness Wednesday. Uh, the the, fo the uh, flash talks include self-care during COVID, yoga for anxiety, and mental health self-care and crisis prevention. Um, those flash talks will run from 12.30 to 1.30 today, so they'll start in just about a half an hour. Best way to find that information to log in would be to go to wsu.edu and in the search box, search for safety fair. Also wanna remind folks that uh, the election is on November 3rd. If you've not registered to vote, the deadline is coming up. Um, please do take advantage of your right to vote. And then finally, to let you know that our 13th COVID-19 town hall is scheduled for Wednesday, November 18th at 11 a.m. Um, again, we'll be focusing on new issues that are evolving as we make decisions about how to address COVID as an institution, but we'll also uh, dig a little bit deeper into some of the research that's being done um, by WSU faculty and, and staff members. So with that, I want to thank our panelists. I also want to thank the subject matter experts who are monitoring the chat function on YouTube. Again, it was an active uh, chat group on, on YouTube, so thank you to the the staff who helped with that. And then finally, once again, wanna thank all of you for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, enjoy the rest of your week. And as the president said, go Cougs. <laughs>